we want to look at how do we authenticate users and especially using passwords to authenticate users. So up until now we've mainly looked at some of the, the algorithms, the protocols for at the, before the midterm for encrypting data. Then we moved on to authentication using public key cryptography. We've looked at hash algorithms, uh, mentioned Max, different authentication techniques. And we've just looked about how do we manage our keys. Here we're going to look at uh, something that's closer to the human, which is authenticating people. Making sure that the person accessing a computer system is who they say they are. And we'll see passwords is the most common form for authenticating people and we'll go through and focus mainly on passwords. So what do we mean by user authentication? Well, here's a, a definition from some glossary. The process of verifying a claim that a system entity or a resource has a certain attribute value. It's a very general definition. That is a system entity. So we want to authenticate something, some entity. It may be some human, it may be usually a piece of software that's trying to access some resource. We want to perf they claim that they have some attribute. For example, you claim you are Steve. Our system needs to verify that claim. So we can check, are you Steve? And therefore, can you access this resource? So a very general definition, but we'll see it's easily described as two steps that we'll see. What we need to do is identify some user and what we do is that the the user presents some identification to the system. So when I say a system, think of a, a computer system. A single computer, a network computers, any computer system. The identification step is that the user that wants to access the system presents their ID. And you usually know that is that they present their ID as their username. To access your to access the online quiz and homework on Moodle, you need to log in. So how do you log in? You present your username to the system saying this is you. So that's the identification step so that the, the system can identify you're claiming to be this person. If I type in my username of Steve, then I'm claiming to be the user Steve. So normally some identity, some username. Generally it's unique amongst the set of users Every user has a different username, but it's not secret. I think most of you know or could guess my username, and you could know or guess the usernames of other people that you know of. So the identity is normally not secret. The second part is verification. You claim to be this user, but the system wants to be sure. It wants to verify, are you actually that user? And how do we verify? The user presents some information or generates some information that acts as evidence. That evidence that proves that that user is who they claim to be. And the common way you know is using a password. If you have that password, then the system assumes that you're that user. A PIN. So for your ATM, ATM card, when you want to get money out of the bank, you type in a PIN. Or maybe some biometric information. You want to access one of the rooms, the senior project room, you need to scan your finger. And it compares your fingerprint against a set of uh, pre-stored information. Often the, this verification step uses information which is secret. Or, if it's not secret, then it should not be able to be generated by others. 
whose fingerprint is secret? Look at your fingerprint. Whose fingerprint is secret? Your fingerprints are not secret, okay? Someone could uh, look at your finger, take a photo, but generally they cannot generate the fingerprint, okay? So it's not necessarily secret, but it's something that they cannot generate uh, electronically unless they could maybe cut your finger off, but then it's not your fingerprint because it's not your finger anymore. So it's not necessarily secret, but it's something that someone else cannot generate. Passwords, pins are secrets, whereas biometric information, maybe uh, your iris, your fingerprint, your voice, is something that is public but hard to generate by someone else. So two steps. Present some ID, saying this is who I claim to be, and pre present some proof, proving you're that person. And there are different forms of presenting the proof. User authentication is everywhere in computer systems. So many computer systems use some form of user authentication. If it doesn't work well, then it presents holes or security flaws in the computer system. So, in general, these things that we use to prove who we are, there are four general approaches for doing so. Something that the user, the individual, knows, something they possess, they have, something they are or something that they do. So what are, they, what are the differences here? So a password or a pin or answers to questions is something that you know. So that's used to prove that you're a particular person. If you know that value, then the system assumes that you're that person who uh, you claim to be. Possession, usually something physical that you have. A key to a door or in electronic computer systems, key cards, for example, swipe a key card, smart cards, uh, USB tokens that you only you should possess and therefore if you possess that then the system assumes it's the correct person. Something you are, something an individual is, refers to biometrics but what we call static biometrics. Your fingerprint, your retina, your face. Usually these are things that uniquely identify you in a set of users. And if you possess that fingerprint, then the system assumes that it's the correct person. Something that you do, also biometrics, but things that change, dynamic biometrics. So your voice pattern. In many cases, a computer system can recognize people based upon their voice patterns. So if you say some words, the signal, the audio signal generated by that person. Your handwriting, maybe your typing rhythm. Those things that you do, if they can uniquely identif identify you in a set of users, can be used as this form for verification. Give me some examples of, apart from passwords on login systems and apart from your ATM, any examples of where you use authentication? No pins, no passwords. Where do you use authentication? Give me an example. What do you use for authentication? Anyone? Fingerprint is one. Who uses fingerprint anywhere? Yes, yeah, some of the some some of you do. Some of you will more so next year. Anyone else? So fingerprint, okay, a common one. What else? Any other forms of authentication you use? Eyes. Where do you scan your eyes? No, maybe maybe you work at the the, the military or, or a top secret organisation. All right, yes, in some, in some cases. 
but I'm looking for your experiences. Anyone else had any other experiences of authentication? A capture? A capture, you know, the, those when you have to type in a, a, a word or a string based upon some picture. It's not very, you're right, it's not verifying who you are. It's verifying if you're human or not. Okay, slightly different. But two people, two different people, can solve the capture and the system cannot distinguish between those people. So a capture is not verifying who you are. Any other examples? Key card. Key card. Okay, some people may have a key card to get into a building. By possessing that key card, the system, the building system, assumes you're the right user, the person to enter. Any others? <coughs> Sorry? Handwriting. Okay. Some systems, bank systems, will, or maybe not computer based initially, but use handwriting to, to recognize who you are? There are some systems that look at the blood vessels. Blood vessels, okay. Uh, and you've experienced that? Uh, yes. Okay, good. Where? What? Um, you don't have to be personal, but uh, to, to authenticate what? To get access to some yeah. organization? Yeah. It, no, okay. It was, uh, basically, cyber school and course. Okay. So okay. Yeah, there are different forms of biometrics. What's the main one you've used? <coughs> Hands up for passwords. Who uses anything more often than passwords? Okay, passwords is the main one that we use. Okay, so there are others. Passwords, a pin or an answer, right? We can think similar or passphrase which is really just a, a, a password that can have spaces in it and can be generally longer than a, a typical password. But usually something you know is the main form. So we're going to focus on those, or specifically on passwords in, in this topic. The others we will not look at. Okay. We're all about authenticating humans. This is a quote from one of the, the secondary textbooks for this course. It says, humans are large and expensive to maintain and difficult to manage, and they pollute the environment. So they're not so useful from that perspective. But unfortunately, it's saying that we, it's astonishing that they can still be manu manufactured. But since there's so many humans around, we must design our computer systems, our protocols, around their limitations. So the point is that in many cases for performing authentication, humans are not so good. If we want to authentic, authentic, authenticate computers, computers can remember large values. They can generate large random values. Uh, they can use algorithms to do so. Whereas humans can normally not remember large large values, large strings, and therefore they're limited and mean that we must design our computer systems around those limitations. So humans are often the, the weakest link in terms of authentication. And that leads to a number of conflicts in, in designing authentication systems. What's your longest password? Approximately. So think about some passwords that you have. What's your password? Don't tell anyone your password. There's the first rule of passwords. You don't tell anyone about what your password is. But think about maybe the length of your password, some of the common ones you use. Let's say less than five characters. Think of your most common password. Who has less than five characters? No one good. What about between 5 and 10 characters? Common passwords that you use on a regular basis. 10 to 15 characters? Okay, so you may have multiple passwords. More than 15 characters? Okay. More than 100 characters? 
Okay, I think once you're getting 15 or more, not many people have passwords longer than 15 characters, and typically longer than 10, in fact. Everyone here knows about computer security, your IT experts, you know to have a long password. But the general population may not have long passwords. So towards the end, there's some slides that give some statistics about password length. And we'll see that most of them are typically in the order of six to 10 characters in length. So we need to look at if we use passwords to authenticate users, what are some of the possible things that can go wrong? Some of the attacks. Some of the issues. And password length will be one important thing. Of course, many computer systems use a combination of an ID and a password. Okay? You log into a website, you need your username and your password. So that's common. How does it work? When you, let's say, when you register for this computer system, when you register with a website, you possibly select a username and password. So when you first register, when you first access, you get to select. Sometimes the system selects for you, sometimes you get to select, but there's a username and password created at the start, and those values are stored on the system. So when you register for a new account with Hotmail, or whatever it's called today, then you choose a username, you choose a password, and the server stores those values in its database. So that's what happens on the registration step. Then when you subsequently try to access that website, what happens is that you submit your username and password. And quite simply, you submit your username and password. The server compares the submitted values against the stored values. If they match, you're authenticated. If they don't match, you're not authenticated. So it's quite simple in how it's performed. But remember, there's a stored username and password initially, and you submit usernames and password, or username and password, and the system compares against the stored values. What about your ID? When you got to choose, when you log into Moodle, did you get to choose your ID? We need some volunteers today. I'm just looking for candidates to volunteer. When you log into Moodle, did you choose your ID, your username? Username. For the Moodle website, did you get to choose the username? What's your username? <laughs> Not your password, your ID. Did you get to choose that? Did I let you choose it? No, I forced you to use your ID. When when you created your email account on Gmail, Hotmail, or whatever, did you get to choose a username? Yes, generally you get to choose a username. Under what conditions? Can you choose any username? Maybe for Facebook, for example. Can you choose any username? What conditions? No, why not? It needs to be unique, okay? It's common that usernames or identities need to be unique. It cannot be the same as an existing user. Any other conditions? It needs to be some length. Usually the username may be longer than some uh, length and most likely shorter than some length. I think you could not have a username on Facebook which is a megabyte in length. Okay, there, there'll be some upper limits and probably a lower limit. I don't think they'll allow a username of X. Okay, so there'll be limits on length. Any other limits? Can Cannot use some symbols. Okay, so some characters would be limited. I think they're the common limits you'll see on usernames. The uniqueness, uh, the, the length, and the, the characters that are possible the character set. So that's really implementation details. Secret or not? 
usernames? No. Your email user username, is it secret? No, because it's in your email address. So usernames normally we assume are public, not secret. What are they used for? So when I say usernames, generally an identity. It's used to identify who you are. So to access some computer system, some website, to determine which user is trying to access. So when you try and log on to Facebook and enter in your username, the server's trying to determine that this is the user who's trying to access. It can sometimes determine the privileges of the user. When you log into the Moodle website and your username is one of the set of student IDs, you get the privilege to do quizzes and so on. When you log in with my ID, you get the privilege to view the quiz answers, to set quizzes and do different things. So usernames also are used for access control and determine what particular users can do once they're authenticated. So access control meaning what permissions do you have to access different resources. So that's the username. We'll not cover that in any more depth. What about the password? Well, we need to look at, well, what is a good password? Any suggestions? Maybe the opposite, what is a bad password? Any, a bad password is easy to remember. Well, that's a bit inconvenient. If I can't remember it, how will I be able to log in? All right, so we'll look at some different, different schemes or password selection strategies. What's good or what's bad? And then uh, look at some trade-offs there. So we'll look at and try and answer some of these questions. The other aspect is, remember what the system does, is when you register, you, let's say you get to choose a username, you get to choose a password, the system stores them, think in a database. And then when you try and log in later, you su submit some values and the system compares against the stored values. One of the issues or questions is, how do we store the passwords? Why do we care? Well, in practice, if someone can access this database of passwords, then they can learn everyone else's password. So the storage of the passwords on the system is an important issue. We'll spend some time on that. How do you submit passwords? That is, you have the website, the servers in the US. You open your browser here in Thailand, and you type in your username and password on a form, and that username and password is sent to the server. So it's submitted to the server. Any suggestions of how that should happen? Yeah, you press the submit button. You hash it first. Maybe, yeah. We'll see the role of a hash. What else could you do? Why do we care? What we worry about is if I'm sending, I type in my password on my browser, for example, and it's being sent to the web server in another country, it's being sent in the clear across the internet. So what if someone on the path between my browser and the server intercepts that packet that can't, contains my username and password? If they can intercept, then they learn my username and password, and now my password is no longer unique or no longer secret to me. So the way to submit the password, in particular the way to communicate the password securely between browser and server or between uh, user application and server application is important. So when you log into Facebook, what do you use? What do you use to make sure the submission is secure? You use your browser, not good enough answer, anything else? How do you, HTTPS, okay? So what you should be doing when you log into a website with a username and password, you want to make sure your communications are encrypted. So with web browsing, for example, use HTTPS. 
most websites or many websites today will allow that the login page at least uses HTTPS. You can check with the Moodle website, it's, it's set up like that. When you log in, it's using HTTPS. What if you supply a username and password and you get it wrong? What does the system return to you? Let's say you type in your correct username and you type in your incorrect password. You make a typing mistake. What should the system send back to you? What sort of message? Wrong username and password. So the message that's sent from the system back to the user saying error, you cannot log in, is important. So there are different options. The system could say back, your username is correct, but your password is wrong. Please try again. Or it could say, let's say, uh, your username and or password are incorrect. Please try again. There's a subtle difference there. And okay, and then the, subsequently is okay. You try again, you get it wrong, and again you get it wrong. And then how does the system respond? Well, maybe it may stop you from having attempts. So we'll see some different security mechanisms that we can use as how can a system respond to incorrect passwords. And that's what we'll do for the rest of this topic and uh, today and on Thursday. Let's go to some of the last slides. We'll come back to the earlier ones. Just some, some statistics about password selection. We will not spend too much time on it. This is some results of someone's found a a database of leaked passwords. What that means is that some website had many users' passwords stored there, usernames and passwords, 300,000 about. And someone did an attack and released that list of passwords to the internet, published them uh, so that others could access. And this person did an analysis of those 300,000 leaked passwords and tried to classify how the person chose that password. And here's some of the classifications. This green 25% saying one quarter of all the passwords that they analyzed were what's called dictionary words. What's a dictionary word in respect to a password? A word from a dictionary. Okay? So consider, let's say, stick with English. Say we have a dictionary, a list of all words in the English language. How many? How many words? About? Anyone? Millions? No less. 20,000, a few more, I think. Generally around 100,000, a few hundred thousand words. Okay? So the number of words in a language is about, right, different languages differ, but in terms of the hundreds of thousands of words. All right, it's more complex when you consider plurals and so on, but let's say we have about 100, 200,000 words. So a dictionary is just this list of words. We don't need the definitions, just the words themselves. So this analysis of people's passwords that they selected, about a quarter of them, people selected words from a dictionary. I mean, they didn't look in a dictionary to select, but they'd used a word from their head, which matches from a common dictionary. Why, why is that not good? What's wrong with choosing a password from a dictionary? Or a word? Brute force. An attacker, if they want to guess your password, what can they do? If they know your username, they submit your username to the system and choose a random word from the dictionary. 
And if it passes, good. If not, then they submit your same username and another word from the dictionary. And they keep trying all 200,000 words from the dictionary. And once they've tried them all, then they've found your password. It's in that set somewhere. So because the number of words in the dictionary is quite small, hundreds of thousands is not too many, if we have automated techniques, we can do an easy brute force and find someone's password if it's from a dictionary. So this analysis suggested about a quarter of the people who chose passwords from this system used words from a dictionary. What are some of the others? This purple one here, 15, 14% numbers. Okay, so they use numbers. No, no letters, just numbers in their password. It doesn't say anything about the length, but usually the length is quite small. A 10 character number password versus a 10 character le password made of letters, which one's better? Numbers or letters? Hands up for letters. Hands up for numbers. Letters, okay? If we consider English, for every letter there's 26 to choose from. With every number there's just 10 to choose from. So the more to choose from, the better. So words, or at least random letters, is better than numbers. What else do they observe? Uh, these blue 14% at the top, person name. So let's say we consider a set of names that we know, and there's not so many, and the passwords that they selected were from this set of names. Again, from an attacker's perspective, they can use a brute force attack. Find all the names which are common for people and try them as a password and you're going to find 14% of the people's passwords in this set. 8% a place name, like a city, a country, uh, a town. Uh, dictionary words, what else have we got? Smaller ones here. This light blue one, is a, this is a short phrase, double word. Okay, Not just one word, but two words combined together, concatenated. And a few others. A keyboard pattern. This one here. So, I don't know, Q, W, E, R, T, Y. You know, the, the top five letters from your keyboard. This 31%, they couldn't recognize a pattern. So maybe they are secure, or more secure than the others. Or maybe that they couldn't get it from the analysis. But the point is that many people choose passwords which are predictable from dictionaries based on names, numbers or places. Therefore, if an attacker tries to guess your password, where do they start? Well, they start with trying from a dictionary because it's highly likely that one of the user has used a word from a dictionary. And they start with people's names, with place names numbers or the sequences of numbers. So it makes it easier for the attacker if you use a password which is predictable like words, numbers, names and so on. We'll see some other uh, suggestions for making it harder for the attacker soon. This is another analysis of about 37,000 passwords and, and looked at their length. So most of the passwords were between six and eight characters. Okay, the most were six and eight. There were some at seven. Very few short ones. And you see not many above 10, 11 or 12. So this may be a typical of many passwords that are selected by a large set of people. Why six to eight? Why do you choose a password of around six to eight characters? Why don't you do it like our security expert back here who chose more than 15 characters? Yes. Why doesn't everyone do that? Because it's, it's, for some people it's hard to remember. For some people it's hard to remember, okay? That is, you need to remember your password. So if you want to remember it rather than having to write it down or put it in a file, 
then you want it to be short. Okay? If, you, if I ask you to remember a 20 character password, it's much harder than remembering a 10 character password. Yes, yeah, so there's some, what, some, some analysis that says that yeah, people can remember between five and nine, seven plus or minus two things. So maybe that's related as well. Uh, but yeah, why, what other reason? Limitation. Maybe some computer systems have limits on the length of the password. You must choose a password less than eight characters. Some systems have that. Not so good. Other reasons. Why use a short password? Yep. And and all right, they may be old people, but so what's wrong with old people? I think you're on, uh, on, uh, on track, but so the length, specifically about the length, what's wrong with a long one then? You've said already, hard to remember, correct? What else? For these old people, what's wrong with a long password? Finding the keys, not just for old people, for anyone, you need to type in the password. Right? On a computer, if, you need to, if I ask you to type in a 30 character password, and you need to do it every day, it takes some time. Okay, so it's much faster to type in a five character password than a 30 character password. What's more, with a 30 character password, you're more likely to make a mistake. You make one mistake, you hit one key wrong, and you'll need to try again. So if you've got six letters in your password, the chance of a mistake is right, much lower than if you've got 30 letters. So it's much more convenient having a shorter password for entering if you're using a mobile phone to enter and you have to press the buttons. Again, the, the inconvenience of typing in a long password it can be quite significant. So that's why people want to use short passwords. What's wrong with a password with five characters long? Let's say it was random. It wasn't from a dictionary, it was in this set of no structure, random, five characters long. What's wrong with it? Uh, recognize, there's, it's random, there's no structure in it. What's wrong with a five character random password? It still may be possible to do brute force. Even with it random, what, what does that mean? Let's say we just have the 26 English letters. When with five characters, we have 26 by 26 by 20. We have 26 to the power of five possible combinations. Do the calculation. It's not so many for a computer to try. So the shorter the po password, even if it's random, the more chance that someone can do a brute force and, and find your password. The same as short keys. The shorter it is, the easier it is to br do a brute force. So, for security reasons, we want a long password. For convenience reasons, we want a short password. So we need to make a trade-off in there as with respect to the password length. Some other analysis that people have done of, of known passwords. Most passwords use only alphanumeric characters, letters and numbers. Okay? Think of your passwords. How many use, pa how many use characters which are not alphanumeric? Okay? Their analysis people do is that most people choose something from A to Z and 0 to 9, or from another language. I'm using English as an example. Thai is no different. Okay? The same statistics would apply. So using non-alphanumeric ca alphanumeric characters can 
make it harder for the attacker to try and guess. Most are in dictionaries or what's called password dictionaries. A normal dictionary has, say, English words. A password dictionary has uh, typical passwords. English words, maybe combinations or variations on those English words that people commonly use, names, places, and so on. Most passwords are predictable. Many users reuse passwords across systems. So this is coming from people doing analysis of passwords selected by real users. Who uses passwords across systems? Put your hand up. If you use one password for two or more different systems. Think carefully. All right. Put your hand up if you don't. If you don't use the same password on any system, maybe a few people, I think most people would use, in, just in some cases, the same password across two or more systems. So we'll talk about later some different strategies there. Generally, you should not. Each website you visit, use a different password. Why? Why? Why use different passwords? Why not use the same password on every website, every login I have? Because if you like somebody got your password, they can access to all Okay, if someone, let's say I use the same password on all my uh, websites I visit, my email accounts, Moodle, my bank, but then someone hacks into the Moodle website and they steal all the passwords and they learn my password now they know the password for all my other accounts. Okay, So that's the reason why you should not reuse passwords across multiple systems. But it turns out many people do. Some very common passwords that people use. Okay, And I'm sure some of you have used these. Okay, I don't look, but sometimes people set passwords on their ICT server or on some computers in the lab and I see them on the keyboard. Yeah, I watch. Now, one, two, three, four. Okay. So there are very common passwords that, again, make it easier for the attacker to guess them. Who changes their password every week? Think of how often you change your password for your, uh, maybe your popular systems or your most important systems. Let's see, every week, who changes their password? Every month? Every six months? Every year? Okay, not many people change their passwords. Again, making it easier for the attacker because if they can uh, learn the password, then that's insecure for the rest of the duration when you don't change it. So this is from studies that people have done on, on password selection. So when we build an authentication system, we must consider this. We mustn't say, we cannot just say, you must use a password of 10, 20 characters. You must not use a dictionary word and so on. It's hard to force people to choose good passwords. What we'll go back to, we'll finish on this, and we'll go back to some of the techniques for um, storing passwords, and actually before that, how to measure the strength of a password. We'll look at entropy. And then we'll look at some of the password selection strategy, strategies and attacks. So we'll continue this on Thursday. Okay. In between now and then, maybe just think about some of those issues and maybe go change your passwords. Note that I'm the admin of the Moodle server. In theory, I could access all your passwords on Moodle. So then think, if I could access your Moodle password, would I be able to access something important from you on maybe your email account, your bank account, or some other financial system? So think about your passwords how you reuse them and over the next week or two or over the next lecture or two we'll discuss other issues.